Welcome to this evening's Small Acreage webinar. Today, we're going to have a chat about protecting our properties over this summer period. My name is Wendy Gill, and I'm the Ag Services Mixed Farming Officer based at Forbes. It's my pleasure to be your facilitator tonight on behalf of the Central West Local Land Services, Biosecurity, Agriculture, and Natural Resource Management teams. For participants, let's take a quick look at the nuts and bolts of engaging with this webinar platform. If you need any assistance during the trouble during this webinar, the troubleshooting and for basic logon in inquiries, please use RET, his number is down the bottom. RET can help you with transferring to a phone connection for this evening's webinar. And as I said, if you just jot down Rhett's number there in blue, he'll be able to offer some assistance as well if you're just having trouble with this uh, facilitation mode this evening. So as you'll see on the right hand side of your control screens now and your control panels, you should have a control panel that looks similar to this on screen at the moment. You can use the orange button to collapse and control this control panel at any time during this evening's presentations. You can also Please note that we are on all mute for all participants. This webinar will be recorded and tomorrow you will all receive an email with additional resources and helpful links for small acreage landholders. Feel free at any time during this webinar to use the control panel to submit questions and also raise your hand to do audio um, LinkedIn questions. I'll unmute you and then ask, get to ask your question directly to the panel. Now, let me introduce the speakers and the panel tonight. I warmly welcome all our panelists this evening. Bronwyn Waters is the Acting District Manager for the Irana Rural Fire Service based at Dubbo. Bronwyn has been a member of the Rural Fire Service for 25 years and supervises 11 staff who are all based in Dubbo. She's participated in international service and state-based service for the RFS. And today, Bronwyn will present to us a presentation titled, Your Property, Your Family and Your Livelihood. Also joining us this evening is Senior Constable Lee Wormsley. Lee is a rural crime investigator with the Rural Crime Prevention Team for the New South Wales Police Force based in Dubbo. Lee's joined the police force in 2010 and has previously worked across a number of locations in New South Wales, including the North Coast, but also he took a position as a lockup keeper in Mungandai Police Station. Lee tonight will be presenting a presentation titled Target Hardening, and I welcome Lee. As your facilitator, I will be the third guest speaker on this evening's panel. In my Ag Services role, I provide extension advice to producers to improve whole farm system connections in mixed farming enterprises. My specialty knowledge and skills are focused around wool production and livestock management. Previously, I've worked in semi dryland arid crop research, private consultancy and commodity marketing in the private sector. For tonight's presentation, I will discuss your summer preparations and farm biosecurity for your property and for this festive period. So now let's get started. And as I change to Bronwyn, who will give our first presentation, I welcome everybody and I'll just unmute Bronwyn. Oh, thank you. Can you hear me fine? Can you see my screen? Yeah, Bronwyn, I'm just changing over now. So I can hear you fine, that's coming through. So just getting your presentation, it's a little bit slow this evening, but I can see your mouse moving there. So if you'd like to just open your PowerPoint there. Have you opened it or is it display? Your should be should be there on your desktop. Yeah, I've got it open on mine. Right, we seem to not be seeing it. We seem to be having a little difficulty with that. Hmm. 
Righto. What I might do is, Bronwyn, we might just, um, there we go. Now it's coming up. No, we've, we've just lost it again. Here we go. Okay. So I can see your desktop screen. Sorry, everybody. We just seem to be having a slight yeah. delay. That should be the full screen for some reason. Right. Okay. While we um while we work out Bronwyn's technical difficulty, I actually might change and um we might start with Lee if that's okay, and I'll um I'll just um sort with Bronwyn. They um see if we can bring up her. Oh, here we go. Bronwyn, we've just seemed yeah. to have it's come come through. There we go. Right, we're in action. That's um technology is a marvelous thing so we'll um right oh Bronwyn we'll um I'll sorry everybody about that little hiccup but we'll um Bron will I'll um throw to you and and look forward to your presentation this evening Welcome. okay thank you and my apologies everybody for for that little hiccup it seems to be a day for me to have issues with um with technology today um, so, just a little bit about the Irana district. We cover the Narrow Mine Shire and Dubbo Regional Council um, areas. Uh, we have a, a bit over 1,800 volunteers within the Royal Fire Service, um, which is about 60 brigades. And at the moment, we have five salaried staff. We normally would have seven. We've got a couple of vacancies there. So, um, just a little bit about what is fire. Just for the very basics, a lot of you probably already know, but um, fire, as we teach our, our firefighters, it's a chemical reaction, gives off heat and, and light. That's normally between oxygen and fuel, uh, and it is started and maintained by heat. And one of the ways that we combat that is removing one of those, heat usually by um, cold water, oxygen um, by smothering, whether it be dirt or extinguishers, and fuel is usually the, the best one out in, um, in properties environment, whether it would be fire breaks or reducing fuel through hazard reduction um, programs. So unfortunately, we've seen a number of properties with uh, this picture of, of late, mainly with um, crop um, harvesting fires uh, recently, or like last night, we had a number of uh, a storm that went through with a number of uh, lightning strikes. Uh, we ended up with 14 new incidents just in one evening, and um, and this could be the result. So it, it's obviously not something that um, most of you yourselves would want to see. So uh, one thing we want to do is to talk about um, whose responsibility it is and how we can prevent having that seen. So out of um, Section 63 of the Rural Fires Act, 1997, it is the duty of the, of the owner and occupier of land to take the notified steps and any other practicable steps to prevent the occurrence of bushfires on and to minimise the danger of spread of bushfires on or from that land. So if you own property or occupy property, it is your responsibility to, to reduce the occurrence of fire, but also to minimise the spread of that fire and also stop it from spreading into neighbouring properties. Uh, and that is, yeah, that is your responsibility. So ways that we could reduce um, the fuel is uh, and protect your assets. And assets we're talking about, whether it be home, machinery sheds, um, grazing uh, properties, uh, crops, fences even, uh, we create asset protection zones. So it's an area of reduced um, fuel. Uh, it provides a bit of a buffer zone, it reduces the chances of ember spotting into other areas, um, reduces damage to buildings, um, and it gives a safe working place for uh, firefighters, whether that would be the rural firefighters or yourselves is, is putting fire out with on your own property. This is a really good example of an asset protection zone. It's got good access for uh, landowners to go out of, the household owners or for firefighters to come into. 
The SWS there, which is static water supply, is a in, with a pool that could be a tank or a dam or creek or anything like that. That's really useful for um, combating fires. And you can see down in the bottom right hand corner is a good example of a not so good asset protection zone um, where the, uh, the shed and, and everything was burnt down there. Um, obviously trees and bushland close by is um, not the best example. So the bushfire danger period um, starts in the 1st of October, that's the statutory starting and, and which is the same in uh, the Arana district um, and we go through to the 31st of March. That can be adjusted occasionally if there is um, extended dry weather towards the end of March or uh, increased rain, we can reduce that, bring that forward a bit. Um, and the bushfire danger period often gets confused with um, fire bans. All the bushfire danger period means is that you'll need a permit to light a fire in the open. Uh, and that's just a safety um, feature that we know that you've taken precautions, whether it would be uh, containment or um, that you have firefighting uh, appliance, um, that you can control that fire on your property. A total fire ban, on the other hand, is declared by the Rural Fire Service when there is um, fire danger, whether that fires become quite um, uh, uncontrollable and, and really dangerous, and that's usually at severe fire danger rating, or sometimes it can be um, a very high, there's uh, activity happening in the area. Yesterday we had severe fire danger rating here, and so there's a, a total fire ban. And the total fire ban means there is to be no burning in the open. It means all fire permits are automatically suspended. And it also means that anything that's hot works like uh, welding or grinding or anything like that, that, that's not to be permitted as well. And we strongly encourage uh, people um, who would normally be slashing or harvesting to reconsider that, especially in the heat of the day in those times, because that's where it sparks. It's amazing how many fires that we get from sparks with slashing and harvesting. Uh, now I'm just going to go through a few of our uh, publications. These are all available on the public website or through the local fire control centre. We can um, send them out to you or you can pick them up. Just a few um, areas that are uh, good advice on if you're wanting to light a fire or undertake uh, burning or hazard reduction, some of the things you might need to consider. Now this one, before you light that fire, it talks about whether you might need environmental approval, whether it's agricultural practice, uh, whether it's for uh, cultural burning or whether you're using fire for heating and cooking. Talks about um, if it's in the bushfire danger period and also who you need to notify. So it's a really good general um, publication that we have. Talking about environmental approval, there uh, is a lot of legislation to consider when you're wanting to undertake hazard reduction, especially with um, whether it be burning or um, by mechanical means. So the Rural Fire Service has what we call a, a bushfire hazard reduction certificate. It uh, is a streamlined process that goes through a step-by-step -step application um, that has a series of questions that you answer to the best of your ability. Things like the, where the, the hazard is, what assets are you trying to protect, how you want to reduce the fuel, whether it would be mechanical or like I said, burning. Um, when was the last time it was burnt? If you know of any threatened species or Aboriginal or cultural heritage or anything else that you might know of there. Um, and then we'll assess that and, um, and either issue uh, an environmental approval to undertake that hazard reduction um, or maybe discuss with you if there's any complications, how we might be able to achieve that. And this is uh, completely free. Uh, some of the other standards I'll just I'll flick through quickly. We have ones about pile burning, about size of pile, where to place it, uh, where not to place them, obviously, when to burn, how to burn, that type of thing. We also have uh, standards for low intensity burning. So if you are going to burn uh, paddocks, grassland, um, uh, 
anything, uh, any vegetation type thing, whether it might be for agricultural purposes to encourage green pick to, uh, to grow or whether it might be for stubble burning after a harvest. Um, sort of trying to get low intensity, it has a lesser uh, environmental impact, but it's also um, a safer way to undertake burning. So that's a really good publication as well. Now I'm going to talk about, uh, just quickly go through the bushfire, bushfire survival plan. Um, we, this is the, the newest one we have at the moment. And it's more about your family, uh, your property, your livelihood, and things that you should consider uh, in preparation for the bushfire season. So we talk about four simple steps to making a bushfire survival plan. Uh, the first one is to discuss it. Discuss it with your family. I don't know how many times I've had conversations with people and um, the wife might say that, no, they're going to be leaving early and the husband might say that, uh, no, we're, we're going to stay and defend our property. Um, then they haven't even thought about if the kids are coming home on the bus or if there is um, animals to, to consider as well, you know, which paddock are they going to put their animals in if they have horses or, or dogs, how are they going to look after those? So a discussion uh, with the family so everybody's on the same page is really important. Then uh, preparing your property. And so um, there are a number of things you can do to prepare your property. I'll just flip to the next slide for that one. So top five actions, trimming over overhanging uh, trees and shrubs, mowing uh, or slashing around the property, around your, your house, your sheds, machinery, good breaks around crops and things like that. Removing any um, material that can burn from around the home. Uh, quite often we have a tendency to store things under our verandas and things like that. That's where embers can get in and, and catch a light. Clearing gutters um, and uh, of leaves and uh, that type of thing as well. That's another place where embers will, will catch and sit and, and smoulder and burn. And having a good water supply and hoses that can reach all the way around uh, your home or shed or whatever the asset is you're trying to protect um, so that if there was a small fire that would start, you can actually get to it before it becomes a big fire. Uh, number three, oh sorry, prepare your uh, rural property. for So for larger properties, we also like to have, um, if you've got some way of having your own firefighting appliance, um, clearing fire breaks around your boundaries, around your crops, around pasture to stop the spread of a fire if it did start. Um, storing petrol, diesel, that type of thing away from your home or sheds. Um, and having having good water supply and like in that uh, asset protection zone picture, the, the static water supply, whether it would be tanks, dams or that type of thing, something that's dedicated for firefighting is really quite important as well. If your property is not prepared, uh, then the suggestion would definitely be to leave early. In any situation, a well-prepared property is more likely to survive whether you're there or not. An unprepared property um, is so being away is the only option. Being away from a property is uh, the safest option in any in any case. One thing we like to have people understand too is the, the bushfire alert levels. Now I've got two pictures there. They're all exactly the same of um, alert levels, except we've got the current ones, which are the top three, advice, watch and act and emergency warning. They tell us what level a fire may be. So if you have the fires near me app or you're looking on the website and you see it, the pictures of the little diamonds, it'll tell you what, what level the fire is and what action you may need to take. So the blue one is um, a fire has started, no immediate danger. Yellow is the watch and act where there is um, the heightened level of threat. Things are changing uh, and you need to start taking action. And the emergency warning is the highest level and that's that you may be in danger. You need to take action immediately. Um, and it may be that you just need to shelter in place. 
Now the ones on the bottom of the of the picture are actually the exact same um, alerts, but it's going to be a national uh, symbol. So these are just changing this month. So instead of the blue, it'll be the yellow with the black flame. Instead of the yellow watch and act, it'll be orange with the black flame. And with the emergency warning, it'll be red triangle with the, the white flame. So that's why I decided to put those in there now. On the app, the new ones are showing, but on the website, it's still the old one. That will change over the next few weeks. Another thing we like to give advice about is staying alert. Um, I know in the heat of the day sometimes we tend to go inside with the air conditioning going, close the blinds and keep cool. Unfortunately, there could be something, a plume of smoke coming over the hill and you don't know about it. So keeping uh, up to date with what's going on is really important. Um, if you do see an unattended fire or, or a smoke plume, ring triple zero is obviously the, be the, the best option to get resources out there. Um, having a look on the website, the Fires Need Me app, which is a, a free smartphone app, um, and it is an excellent idea to, to find something really quickly, especially if you're out in the paddock. You can actually set watch zones for that as well, which you can have 20 metres of your area, 50 metres of your area, and it'll alert you, send you an alert if something comes up within your area listening to uh, local radio uh, and, and TV, and there's also social media, Facebook, Twitter, and that type of thing. It's a good way, and lots of different ways of keeping alert, and as well as looking out your window and, and keeping um, aware of the surroundings, what's happening. There's another example of the fires near me picture, um, and uh, the alert zones that you can set, and it, it's free, it's a free app, and it's a great, great app. There's some examples of static water supply, um, you know, whether it would be a tank or a dam. We have these uh, little signs that shows on the post there, SWS. We have those here that we can give you for free. You can put them on your gate uh, to alert um, firefighters that there is water available for them to come and help fight a fire on your property or nearby. And that is my session. So. Um, Thank you, and I'll, I'll uh, take questions at the end. Thanks very much, Bron. That was a great, um, a great session, and I think there was a lot of information there for our, for our participants to really gauge and 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 learn about and and put some really practical um, conversations with their family around um, their survival plan, but also getting prepared for summer and and even just a few of those pictures about those static water supplies is a great. It's um, great knowledge base to be able to sort of judge, you know, where some of those things should be sort of positioned to be as effective as possible if um, if you're in that sort of situation and presented with a fire risk this summer. So I'll just hand over to our second presenter and um, and we'll we'll move to Senior Constable Lee Wormsley and I welcome Lee um, to this evening's discussions. Just. Sorry, Lee. I sh hopefully your screen should be um, should be there, and just got you off your microphones on, and your webcam should be activated as well. You're right to start whenever you'd like, Lee. Your yep, webcam does there. appear to yeah, your webcam does appear to be not um, not liking this evening's little. Um, idea to present but we'll um, we'll persist and, and go um, and yeah you're welcome to, to start whenever you're ready. No worries, thank you. I'll just open this up. Got it. Um, thank you, Wendy. Thanks everyone for logging in. Um, like Wendy said, my name's Wayne Clark Senior Constable Lee Wormsley from the Rural Crime Prevention Team um, and I'm stationed at Dubbo Police Station. Um, this particular presentation is about tackling rural crime and target hardening. So this um, presentation was developed with the New South Wales Police Force, working with the New South Wales Farmers Association to help improve the way farmers and rural industries assess the security of their property to reduce the risk of rural crime. So 
just a brief um, history of the rural crime prevention team. It was uh, brought about to replace the original stock squad. So in the early 1980s, the New South Wales Police Force stock squad was dissolved. Um, and then into the 1990s, the prices of livestock and grain increased, and with that, increased rural crime. In the year 2000, the Minister for Police, Minister for Agriculture, uh, for Agriculture and the President of the New South Wales Farmers Association held a meeting and created the New South Wales Partial Agricultural Crime Working Party. This party submitted a report to the Ministers with some pretty severe recommendations. 2002 saw the introduction of 33 rural crime investigators within the New South Wales Police Force. In 2017, the current Commissioner Mick Fuller announced the creation of the Real Crime Prevention Team across regional New South Wales. In 2018, the Real Crime Prevention Team was officially established. Since that time, a further 11 Real Crime Investigator positions have been made, with an additional 18 positions being made over the next few years. So here's just the um, organisational structure of the Real Crime Prevention Team. As you can see there at the top, we have a Assistant Commissioner who's our corporate sponsor for real crime. Um, and below him, we have a sector chief inspector who's the state real crime coordinator. Below him is uh, the four zone coordinators for the southern zone, the central zone, the northwest zone, and the northern zone. And they are all detective sergeants. Down below them, you can see there is uh, where the real crime investigators are located, um, all being detective senior constables. You can see there where those allocated those resources are allocated. Just a, um, a map about um, where those zones are located and where those um, investigators are also located. So as you can see there, the central zone is segmented by two separate spots, uh, in the pink, northwest zones in the orange, and the blue is the northern zone, and then down to the opaque sort of white colour, which is the southern zone. So the blue circles there, um, indicate the location of the real crime investigators. The green location, the green circles indicate the location of your detective sergeants, and then the red circle is the location of our detective chief inspector in a budget. So what is real crime? Real crime is incidents of crime that impacts on the function of the pastoral, agricultural, and aquaculture industries. So it's a fairly broad definition, as we can as we understand. So this particular part is um, on target hardening and what you can do to protect your property. So the first um, part of this target hardening is to remove remove those targets, so target removal. At this time of the year, as the harvest winds up and selling begins, large amounts of chemical can be around on farms and can be on hand. Keeping those chemicals locked away in sheds will go a long way to preventing their theft, as obviously those chemicals are quite expensive and hard to replace when everyone else is after them. Um, you need to secure those smaller, readily disposable items such as quad bikes, chainsaws, motorbikes, and tools by locking them away in sheds and removing any keys where possible. And make sure all your firearms are secured in approved firearm safe, which complies with the safe storage legislation. Make sure you've um, get your firearms key and so your gun safe and store that somewhere that isn't in an obvious location within the same room or the same shed as your, your firearms. Um, and you've got to be aware now the firearms can no longer be stored on unoccupied properties. So they have to be somewhere where somewhere is, someone is actually living and within with on that property as well. So the next part of target hunting is hardening is by removing the means to commit the crimes. So most farms and bigger operations have their own fuel these days. Fuel tanks uh, on farms should be positioned in a, inside of homesteads and the bowser should be locked and secured when it's not in use. Um, you should remove any of the keys from any vehicles and machinery and that will go a long way to preventing the theft. Put away any of your tools such as angle grinders, officer sets and rams which may assist uh, criminals or people that don't have access to your place to get into areas they shouldn't be into. Next part is about reducing the payoff. Reduce the gain for the criminal if the crime is committed. So don't leave any valuable items such as um, materials or in locations that may attract attention. Uh, a classic one for this is leaving fuel trailers in secluded paddocks 
for offensive gear on a fence line near a road, obviously they'll gain too much attention and um, may expose you to having those items stolen. So next we're going to talk about um, asset, uh, access control. So you need to control the access to your property and to the buildings on that property. Ensure your sheds and buildings are locked when they're not in use. Ensure your gates are locked in areas of the farm where they aren't regularly used. It's also a good idea to lock up your stockyards and your ramps when they're not in use to prevent other people from using them without your permission. The next part about visibility and surveillance. The most obvious measure that comes to my mind is the installation of surveillance cameras on your property. This can be anything from a high-tech CCTV system installed by a security company to measures as simple as installation of trail cameras at entry points at your farm. These are great tools. These are great tools for you as owners to manage who is coming on and off your property, but also for us as police to investigate and prosecute crimes if they do occur. Um, any trees or shrubs around your homestead and sheds should be trimmed to reduce hiding places to increase and to increase invisibility, increase visibility, sorry, to and from the main residence. So on to um, environmental design. Change the environment um, of your property layout to reduce the opportunity to commit crime. Any new sheds or structures that you're planning to build on the property should be within view of a residence now. Um, obviously that's going to help you monitor what's occurring there and let you be alerted if something's going wrong. Well. The next part of target hardening is about rule setting. As you can see from in the background there, there's a couple of signs which are available from either us at police or other government departments such as local land services. These warning type signs should be displayed on improved defence lines and gates to clearly identify your property. Ensuring that all persons that have access to your, your property for activities such as hunting, fishing, camping, are well aware of what they're allowed to do on your property whilst there is obviously a good idea. So increase the chance of getting caught. Anything that slows the criminal down increases the risk of them being caught. Even for small acreage owners, it's very important to mark your stock um, your livestock with NRLS identifiers, brands and earmarks wherever it is possible. By marking stock in numerous different ways, it makes it significantly harder for the criminals to dispose of those animals if they are stolen. Same goes for your tools and your valuable items. Uh, permanently marking or engraving valuable tools and equipment and keep a record of them including their serial numbers. Take photos of those valuable items and keep them for your record as well. Over the Christmas period, obviously, a lot of people are going to be away from their properties. Inform your neighbours and the police that you'll be away over the Christmas period and get them to check in on your property while, while you are away. It's a good idea to leave them your contact details as well in case something does go wrong. Just a couple of ways. Um, obviously, you can get in touch with the police. The obvious one that's been around for a long time is triple zero. If there's an emergency on your property and something happening now, um, triple zero is the best way to get in touch with the police um, or 112 if you're on a mobile phone. Uh, the next way is the police assistance line or non-urgent reporting of crime. So that's where something's occurred. Um, it's no longer an emergency situation. Um, you just like to report it. That's the best way to go about that. You can do it from the cup of your own home over the phone. The next way um, is Crime Stoppers is to provide um, information anonymously to police. Um, about any information you may have or to report crimes that have occurred. That's one eight hundred triple three triple zero. And the last way that you can obviously report is through the community portal, which is online. Um, again, for non-emergency police reports, and um, it's obviously a secure way to do that as well. You can always call your local police station uh, or pop into your local police station and talk to your local police there. Um, or if you're in a location where the real crime investigators are, feel free to pop in and have a chat with them about any issues you might have. Um, just how to get in touch with us on Facebook. This is our Facebook page here. It's um, quite an active Facebook page and managed by our policy officer who does a fantastic job. Um, she's always updating it and letting people know what's going on with us and what we're up to and what's happening in the real crime space. Thanks for logging in. If you have any questions or any anything else you need um, information on, just um, feel free to ask at the end. Thanks very much.
Thanks, Lee. That's um, that's some great information as well. Where um, even just those those contact numbers, I think, are really worthwhile just jotting down and and being able to refer to use the correct number for whatever the, the type of the inquiry you have. But um, yeah, so I thank you very much for for giving that presentation. Just um, just turn turn some screens over here. So I look forward to asking. Lee some uh, questions. We've, we've got a few starting to come through for the question and answer session after my presentation. So we'll um, we'll get stuck into that and um, and we really look forward to to being able to um, to hear some of the answers to, to both Bron and Lee's questions tonight. So so let's get started and look at your summer preparations for your property and and farm biosecurity risks for over particularly the festive season as it's fast approaching and and we're now well and truly two days into summer. So, so summer preparations for producers in terms of their small acreage, I suppose we've got a couple of different areas depending on your type of little enterprise that you run. Um, but there is a majority focus uh, around a lot more things to consider if you've got livestock and animals on your property while you get prepared. For, for summer and for the festive um, period. But certainly for anybody that doesn't have livestock on, things like um, that you'd need to check and, and be aware of around your domestic and household areas could be going and regularly checking your pumps and, and the water storage. Again, similar to bronze uh, discussions about where they're positioned, what how full are they and general uh, maintenance requirements on those. So then you can get the best, um, best use out of those while we're particularly in this hot weather and and, uh, and in the summer season. So if you are also got no livestock, other types of um, summer preparations that you can do around your property include obviously any service and, and maintenance might be on some pumps or getting um, some of those chemical stores up to date and, and everything put away and, and not only for crime risk and, and for fire risk, but also just um, for making sure if you are having visitors on farm that people and young children are, are safe in terms of accessing keys and those sorts of things on farms and and even just storage of those of those chemicals and um and you know any any potential hazards that may be um may be floating around that that you know about but um but maybe other visitors on your farm may may not know or be readily aware as um that they're there and, and the danger that that they present so if you have livestock in terms of summer preparations, um, the the thing to probably check off and, and be prepared if you're going away, particularly making sure that you've got enough feed on hand. Um, I know we've had a fantastic season this year. However, um, a lot of our grass pastures, and if you have got any smaller acreage of, of little crops that have been harvested, those have obviously reach and, and reaching the end of their, their life stages and growth stages. So they are becoming drier and, and of less feed value to your livestock. Uh, therefore then, you know, you may need to still consider having some access to some feed on hand, whether that's some hay or some grain, um, to be able to not only feed your livestock over this summer period to get and maintain some production benefits for yourselves, but also to ensure your livestock stay healthy and for, for any welfare considerations as well. So if you are going away, please consider obviously making sure you've got those stores and stores available and that you, um, you've checked all those stores because we've got a lot of businesses that obviously shut down over the Christmas period. And so readily available um, sources of those, those feed, if you go to source them, may not be there when you actually need them. Other is issues or things to consider, I suppose, is water. And I'll touch on that a bit more in our presentation tonight. And also thinking about maybe weed risk. So if you're um, moving livestock or about to move livestock into a new paddock um, to get the best available summer feed onto some new pastures, that sort of thing, I'd really strongly advise you to go into the paddock first, go and check it, particularly if, if before you're going away or even as, as it is a new paddock, Go in and check the paddock and look for any potential risks around weed toxicities and poisonings. Often over summer, we see a large increase with these summer storms. They often bring a germination uh, event of a lot of weeds as well. Um, and this therefore then means that, you know, 
they sometimes are a little bit more palatable than some of the some of the feed on offer in your paddocks and um, the livestock tend to sort of have a natural tendency to be able to find those weeds and and uh, and be a little bit more attracted to those at certain growth stages of those plants and and this might be for instance marshmallow weed or um, even things like uh, cat head we do see an, an increasing incidence particularly in our northern region around coonabarabran of coonabarabran staggers um, which is which is a, a uh, an effect based on on a weed toxicity of cat heads. So I strongly advise people to go and have a look in their paddocks and um, before they put their livestock in and, and be comfortable in the fact that you're not going to run into any little hiccups and issues. And obviously, if you do seek some assistance from private veterinarians as well to to manage the treatment of those those livestock. In terms of water uh, it is essential requirement for all livestock and it's something that we really need to uh, address because we are in summer um, not only from a firefighting and a um, resource perspective um, as bronze indicated the the value of having good reliable water for for the managing that fire risk but also in terms of um, livestock to get the best pr production and performance out of out of livestock so the areas that we consider when we talk about water uh, whether it's for your household or whether it's for your actual domestic and livestock use um, you know you may have access to bores I know a lot of smaller acreages do and then there's also access to little creeks or river frontages um, or just you know groundwater dams as well so water is never uh, static it's it's always changing and its quality um, will always be changing as well so it's something that we do regularly need to monitor throughout the season and i suppose over some of that peak demand is always um is always heightened so when we uh when we talk about water often we talk and and i sort of focus around the quality aspect in terms of the ph so we generally say that most water um, should be between six and a half and eight uh, in in ph um, another area of, of quality that really does affect its use and its availability, whether it's for washing of vehicles, um, helping you with bicycle, manage biosecurity risks, or even you know to be able to use it in your pool, the using and addressing and looking at your water storage and sources around its salinity levels. Um, we often think and have uh, quite resilient livestock in terms of how they can self monitor and, and remediate themselves in terms of how much salt that they can actually tolerate and still be productive. However, one of the big considerations with that is is actually knowing how how saline some of your water storages are because that's that way you can best manage the best way to get um, get value out of your water storages and um, and the best way to do that is obviously to get a, a standard water test. So um, I'd certainly advise and encourage anybody to to get water tests if they haven't done one recently um, because different elements and seasons make your different water storages change. Another area to consider around and think about your water quality, particularly for livestock, is around the turbidity or muddiness, particularly for groundwater storages, those little dams that we often see on smaller acreages. Um, with all these summer storms going on, we have increases incidence of runoff and that often occurs um, and causes some level of, of murkiness or change in the turbidity, so suspension of all the sand, silt and clay particles. And this can um, this can cause some rejection of water from some livestock, particularly younger livestock. And it's really important that as we hit these, these really uh, intense heat wave periods that we don't have or are able to manage which water sources are available so that the best quality and lowest turbidity can uh, can be achieved in terms of being able to um, give that access to those livestock so that they don't become dehydrated and we don't have poor, poor performance or poor production and, and welfare. One of the uh, big areas we also see in summer is blue-green algae and that's a, another quality concern just to, for producers and um, landholders to be aware of. Certainly we, uh, you know, Algae is, is a living plant and it's it's not something to um, necessarily um, think that it's all algae are bad, but certainly blue-green algae is something to, to be mindful of. If you are concerned, you know, looking for that green scum um, and the, the, the true characteristics of blue-green algae, 
please make sure before you put livestock onto any water source, you actually check all your water sources, whether that's troughs or dams, um, and make sure that you're not seeing any signs and symptoms and early indications of, of effects of blue-green algae on that water source. There is no, um, no, no treatment. Often we see a quick and dramatic loss of um, loss of animal um, life if if they are exposed to blue green algae and and the best way to prevent or manage that exposure is obviously directly remove stock straight away and and call your district veterinarian or your private veterinarian to undertake a water test um, to clarify it and make sure that it, it isn't um, blue green algae there's a lot of toxins that are released and and often that change can be quite quick um, and there's no sort of direct relationship with with different weather events. So um, it's something that occurs over summer and not necessarily always in the same type of environment. So I'd really urge uh, all landholders to really just be aware over summer of the blue green algae risk, which will increase as as we as the season gets hotter. One of the other things I suppose is important to note is quantity of water that's required for your livestock. So um, you can see there on the table on your right. Sheep um, need about four litres maximum um, consumption per head per day. And depending on uh, if they're lactating and, and have lambs at foot, you know, their, their consumption needs actually increase up to 10 litres. Cattle, for instance, again, uh, lactating cows and can, go, can need in summertime up to 100 litres a day. And also young stock, um, you know, around that 50 to 80 litres, litres a day, depending on on their weight and uh, a few other factors. Interesting to note, horses as well are, um, are a big requirer of, of good water. So they also need about 50 litres a day. And obviously the, the hotter those conditions, um, we need to manage the, the quantity in terms of peak flows and um, peak requirements in terms of when those livestock are, are actually trying to access the water source. Um, so it is important that producers uh, whilst you can go and check and regularly can clean or perform some maintenance on any of your any of your water storages. So regularly cleaning troughs out will improve not only the quality but also ensure that you're maximising and having peak flows in terms of having you know properly accessing float valves and um, and good pressure through any pumping systems that you may have on on farm. Again, as I said, um, if you're concerned at all about any of your water quality, um, you can access um, this test um, with water testing available at any of the local land services offices. At, at the front office, you can just drop in and pick up a test kit and they go away to the Department of Primary Industries water testing labs up in Moorulumba and, um, and you'll get a, for $70, it's a, it's a standard test which goes through and explains not only the use for livestock purposes but also you know can you use some of these water sources for for instance in your hot water system or to wash down vehicles for cleaning of equipment on farm and that sort of stuff as well so um, it is a great little test and I do encourage producers to um, to really engage and utilize that as well if they're concerned about any water quality issues for your um, for your property. Just a reminder, uh, it's timely uh, that this webinar is um, being come about in terms of some national vendor declaration and LPA changes that um, just need to raise with any of the livestock producers. So as of the 1st of January, there is a requirement for all um, producers of, of any livestock cattle, EU cattle, bobby calves, goats, sheep, lambs. Uh, it includes the whole lot all national vendor declarations need to be updated. So whether you have a, a ENVD declaration system that you use or you're using the traditional um, printed book type national vendor declarations that we see, um, there, there is a requirement for you to actually um, get the new books and that starts in, in commencement as of the 1st of January this coming year. So uh, only version 0720 will be accepted um, at any of the selling centres moving forward into that new year. So um, while you've still got you know 28 days left in in this December month to get that organised, it's a great time just to um, make sure you've ticked that one off your list as well. In terms of um, on-farm biosecurity over the festive season, I suppose with uh, changes in COVID and now obviously some state state uh, border restrictions being eased, which is great to see. We um, we now start to change 
change and move our focus to that there is going to be a lot of people traveling not only on our roads and and across across all of our our um, central west region but we also probably are more um, at risk around the fact that there is probably going to be a lot more family members and friends uh, visiting farms in terms of um, in terms of the holiday season so in terms of preparing your properties around farm biosecurity obviously your biosecurity plans are there to help you manage your property's risk in terms of um, the risk to developing or or having exposure to any plant pest or um, or animal diseases and so it's really important that obviously there's a number of the signs as Lee has said regarding different um, you know trespassing sort of signs or the signs you see on screen there about farm biosecurity they're really important measures about having it visible to all people that are entering onto your farm that you know you have a plan and that there are ways that you're looking to mitigate some of these risks so um, ways ways you need to think about visitors I suppose is they also bring risk with them in terms of your farm and your production enterprises, whether it's big or small, it doesn't matter how big your, your little land uh, parcel is um, or how small it is, the same production risks are there. Um, and so, you know, we can have spread of weeds and contaminates of plant material being brought on farm, or we can have, um, you know, diseases or animal diseases or pests being brought, you know, on farm that are, you know, that are, not necessarily visibly seen all, all the time, but you know, your um, your sometimes your 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 visitors will be your your host or your vector of, of transport. So it's really important for you to decide how practically you would like to manage that on on your own little block. And um, one of the one of the ways I'd suggest is you know simple things in terms of biosecurity plan might be to make sure prior to your arrival. You might have a discussion with your visitors to say, please wash your car before you come on farm. If you're somebody that likes to go hunting or if you're somebody that's, um, that has hunters and, and people that like to camp on your little block, etc., you know, you might actually go through and actually actively ask them prior to them um, coming on farm to, you know, again, wash their equipment and have clean clean clothes and those sorts of things on so then they're not transporting weed seeds and and unknowing vectors onto your your property and spreading them wherever they're going so we'd encourage people and producers to keep a log of you know obviously your visitors um who who the who has been on farm and then wh where and what sections of farm they might might have been able to access uh, that will help being able to minimize and reduce and know where your risks are in terms of spread of of, you know some of these pests or weeds etc when they do arrive on on farm and it's lovely and you've got them settled in um, I'd strongly encourage you to have a chat and sit them down and have a bit of an induction um, that may be as simple as pointing out to them on the map over a cup of coffee or a cold beverage that you actually would like them only to drive on formed roads um, you check that their vehicle has come on clean and themselves or any of their camping gear or, or caravans and trailers and camp um, you know, you might then also have the discussion with them about um, optimally keeping those those um, visitors away from some of your high production areas, such as you know your sheep yards or your cattle yards, those sorts of things, and just ma maintaining a simple hygiene practice, such as you know scrubbing your, scrubbing their boots that they're going to use on farm, etc., um, would be a great way to ensure you know, you're minimising some of your risks. So, as I've said there, it's it's about just choosing what components you're going to implement in terms of knowing and identifying the risks that some of your visitors may have um, to your to your farm and to some of your animals or the type of production um, you have whether it's a vineyard or whether it's um, organic status um, in terms of your um, your type of enterprise but uh, going through a few of those those helpful practical things would would ensure that you're reducing your risk where, as much as possible the biggest thing is I suppose prior to and post those visitors coming and having a lovely Christmas period with you is obviously to go and monitor those areas that that you know that those those visitors have been at um, so their camp areas or it might be where those where your visitors have parked in terms of your designated parking area and if after a rain event you're looking specifically and worried about weeds for instance you might go and look at those areas and make sure 10 days afterwards you know a, the, those plants if they're germinating so then you can keep an eye on what weed germinations are happening and then you can treat 
that affected area appropriately and in a timely, responsible manner. Um, if you are worried at all and you do find that you you are concerned or that you have a um, have an incident where you think there's there's something unusual, you can report any um, any suspected uh, emergency animal disease or exotic plant pest um, that you're worried about to any of those 1800 numbers that I've got on screen now as well. So I'd strongly really encourage you if you haven't got a biosecurity plan or if you're partway through making one that suits your individual enterprise to go to the farm biosecurity website, which I've got on screen. It's got some fantastic little videos and resources in terms of and templates that you can use in terms of choosing what enterprises that are on your little uh, area and farm that then you can make sure that you're ticking off some really practical ways of, of addressing biosecurity on your on your farm. That's um, that's the wrap for me tonight in terms of presentation and getting prepared for, for summer. Thank you for that. I'll now go and um, invite both Bron and both Bron and Lee back on to, um, to our panel and we'll just get into a question and answer time as well. Um, I've got a number of questions coming up. So, um, right, so I'd like to ask the first question of uh, Bronwyn, if I can. Bronwyn, I've got a question here from Gary. Um, Bronwyn, Gary said, can he still do any hazard reduction burns at the moment? And what conditions should he wait for, for that burn to be most effective in terms of um, achieving, you know, a safe burn, but um, to achieve a, a good hazard reduction. Is, is that still possible in, in now that we've hit summer and we're two days into summer, or is it something that needs to be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis? It is a case-by-case -case basis. Um, if he'd asked yesterday, uh, I would have said definitely no. Um, today, if it, um, yes, it, it could very well be. The fire danger rating was only at level um, high. Um, so it really is uh, to apply for a permit at this time of year and then um, just keep an eye on the weather and plan ahead uh, of you know when you're going to do it and what the next few days might be um, after you're burning as well. Sometimes we might have some smouldering logs or bits and pieces left behind uh, afterwards, and then if they uh, if we get some bad weather that could get away on us then. So um, it, sometimes you, uh, you can just give us a call um, or on the uh, public website as well, it will say uh, what the fire danger rating is. Anything of very high and above, so very high, severe, extreme or catastrophic, will automatically suspend a permit. So it only could be up to fire danger rating of high. Um, then, yeah, once it gets into severe, that's when we get total fire bans. Great. Okay. All right. Thank you very much for that, Bronwyn. And um, I'll shoot the first question to Lee. So I've got here, um, got Glenn here says, my property is hard to find. How can I make it easier for police to find find my property if needed? What's what's some advice for, for, for Glenn in that circumstance? Yeah, thanks, Glenn. Um, obviously, there's a number of ways you can make your property a little bit more identifiable and make it easier for the police or emergency services to find it. Um, the, most, the most probably obvious one would be to get a roadside mailbox number. Um, in, in towns and in, in rural, um, sorry, in urban areas, they're pretty common, everyone has them, but in those sort of remoter um, rural areas where the bigger properties are, not everyone has them and they might just go by property names. Um, property names don't really mean a great deal to the police or to other emergency services. Um, sometimes we record property names on our system, sometimes we don't. Um, and, you know, there, there might be 85 different Wilgers in, you know, Western New South Wales. So it's really important to try and get that roadside mailbox number um, out the front of your property, so out the front of your main gate, and get it printed on either, you know, your fence post or your gateway, so everyone knows exactly where they're going. If there's an emergency, you know, we know where we're going, the RFS know where we're going. Sometimes it's also not a bad idea to get your GPS coordinates to your homestead. Um, might be a bit overkill in some people's regard, but on the bigger properties, properties can be massive and it's pretty hard to find the, the main homestead. 
um, especially on those bigger properties where there's numerous homesteads or you know there's roads going everywhere. So getting that GPS coordinate and putting it on your, your mailbox or out the front of your property isn't a bad idea either. Um, just so straight away, if the police or the RFS turn up to responding to an emergency, we, we can punch that in and we know exactly where we're going. So that, that'd be that'd be the best way to go about it from, from that regard anyway. Great, okay, all right, not a worry. And, um, and so, Brian, I've got one here um, from Stephen. Stephen asks, can my local brigade do hazard reduction for me on my property? Uh, they can do. Um, obviously, being volunteers, we have to take in consideration of what their availability might be. Uh, normally, we ask for a request for RFS assistance form um, to be completed. Uh, and then it becomes the landowner's responsibility to obtain a permit and also obtain any environmental approval that might be required as well, have containment in place um, as well. And then, uh, yeah, then the, the brigade, if they're willing to, can come out and, and give a hand, yes. We do have a number of brigades that do do that. But, um, obviously, if you were to ask you in this, these weeks that have been around at the moment, uh, it may not because they're very, they're quite busy with harvesting. Um, but yeah, it all depends on their availability. Yeah, right. No, that's a great, uh, great source of uh, knowledge there. Um, so Lee, I've got, um, I've got another question for yourself. They're coming in thick and fast here. So um, I've got one from Chris that says, can I use a surveillance camera along my road access? I know you touched a little bit on surveillance cameras. So, what's um, what's the restrictions and um, sort of best practice around surveillance cameras? Yeah, righto. So, in terms of um, surveillance cameras, it's dictated by the Surveillance Devices Act. Um, and if it's on your property, if the the position that you're planning to put that camera is on your property, um, it, there's no dramas. You can do that anywhere you like. There's no restrictions on on your own property of where you can do that. Um, just need to be mindful that obviously um, if that camera is pointing into public property, so a main road or public road, um, that's something you need to be aware of. You can still do it, um, but it's just in, in terms of what we might be able to do with it later is what it comes down to. Um, so my advice would be if you are planning to set one up, it would be put it on your own property and face it towards your property. If, if there's a reason that you need to face it away towards um, onto public property, then obviously that's something you need to consider. Um, but yeah, by all means, on your own property, there's no restrictions of where you can put them and what you can what you can gather and use from them. Well, okay, great. And um, and another question here for um, for Bron um, is, how would a new landholder, particularly um, with January seems to be moving month as well, I suppose. A lot of people move houses and, and, and take on new ventures in, in the new year. Um, for those landholders that are smaller, how would they actually go about finding out what brigade um, sort of covers their little small land holding in, in sort of a close proximity to a town, like even like Dubbo, but they're just, they might have a 25 acre block a bit further out. How would they sort of work out what brigade might cover that area or, or how they might get involved with their local RFS in for that little brigade? How, how's the best avenue with that? Yeah, I think the best um, way is to, to ring the fire control centre here. Uh, the number for that is 6881 I probably should have put that up in my PowerPoint. Um, and we can look up uh, your address in the area and give you the contact of the local brigade captain for that area as well, yeah. Okay, great. Great, and um, I've got to just leave a question for yourself as well. Um, from Jennifer, it says, what do I do if someone sees, if I see someone on my property, sorry, can I detain them? Yeah, it's a good question, Jennifer. We get asked that quite a bit. Um, the answer, the, the easy answer or the short answer is yes, you can, um, but it wouldn't be my advice, um, purely because there is, there is a provision in the legislation for civilians to um, conduct their own arrests um, if the fence has been detected. However, you're leaving yourself over to open to liability. Um, and also not only that, but the, your own safety is probably more paramount that's what it comes to. 
So if there is someone on your property and depending on what they're doing, obviously, if they're, if they're there, they're poaching, they're chasing pigs illegally, um, that's still something you can probably jump on Triple O and ring Triple O about because um, you're, not, you're not aware of what they're going to do and what their intentions are. So the way I try and um, advise farmers and uh, rural landowners to approach it is if, if someone's on your property, it's not that dissimilar to someone in town, has someone in their yard, and for that circumstance, that would ring triple O. So I'd encourage you to do the same thing. But in terms of detaining people on your property, um, you can be done, but use it with caution. And obviously, your own your own safety is the most paramount thing. And on that regard, I would advise against it. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Safety, safety first. In terms of personal safety, is always the best um, evasive action, I think. Um, Right, so I've got uh, Christy's sent a message in and it's actually aimed towards me. So I'll, I'll take the next question and give you guys a breather, Ron and Lee. Um, it says, where can I get, um, from Christy, where can I get my water testing kits to check on my water quality? So um, in terms of that, so water testing, you can get, um, if it's for, for household use only, um, because there are some certain tests to do with health regulations and that sort of stuff. If um, if you're worried about household water sources, um, you need to go through your local council. However, if you're looking for stock and domestic use and uh, for your rural land holding, that sort of stuff, uh, and nothing to do with, say, your household testing of water, you can come to any local land services office and or wing the DPI um, water testing lab and they... Um, all local land service officers have some water test kits available and it's just pick up the little canister. It's got a bottle in the canister with the paperwork and um, it's just simply taking a sample. Uh, and certainly if you need some information about the best way to take a sample out of um, out of a dam or out of your, your different water sources, you can find um, some resource articles about how to best to do that on the local land services Central West website as well. Um, but you take the little sample, fill the jar up and essentially put it back in the canister with the filled out paperwork and seal it all up and send it in the mail um, and that'll go off to D the DPI water testing labs. So uh, I hope that's um, cleared that one up for you, Christy, as well. Um, so Lee, an, another one for yourself, it says, if my sheep get into the neighbours and I can't contact them, can I just go and get them out without permission? This is probably really... Yeah, that's a bit of a tricky one as well and um, something that obviously the local land services deal with a bit as well. Um, it depends, really. The, the short answer is no. If um, if your sheep or your cattle have strayed into your neighbour's place without their permission, you really can't enter their property. Um, a, a lot of times, people are really understanding in farming and rural area of uh, in rural areas, and there's pretty good relationships between them, and they can come and go from each other's properties, and that's pretty accepted. But from a, a legal legal standpoint and a legal side of things, no, you you can't just walk on and, and round your own stock up. If um, if you have you know, you have you can see them on the other side, or you have suspicions of which way they might have gone, and you can somehow confirm that. You can um, apply to get a um, a stock recovery order, um, and that's through usually it's through assistance with the LOS, I believe, and then um, obviously through one of the local courts to to determine whether or not that's needed or not. But short answer for your question: No, you can't just walk into your neighbour's place and um, round up your own cattle or sheep. Okay, all right, that's probably really timely information to get that nice and cleared up, I think. Um, so, um, Lee, another one for you. Um, this one's from, from Peter. It says, I'm worried about my firearms being stolen while I'm away for Christmas. What can I do to protect them from theft? Yeah, no dramas, Peter. Um, yeah, there's a couple of things that you can obviously do. Look, I touched on a couple of them in, in my presentation, but the main thing, and it should be done every day anyway as a firearms owner, but making sure that you have a firearm safe that complies with legislation and making sure that safe secured well to the structure and that the way that's secured is actually complying with the legislation as well. Um, if you're heading away for Christmas, obviously um, it'd be a good idea to take the keys. If there's keys to that safe, take those keys with you. Don't leave them at the house. Um, so then obviously that reduces the, the risk of someone finding those keys if they do break into your place. Um, the next and the last option I sort of try and explain to farmers as well, going away for extended periods from their from their place, 
is um, explore the possibility of maybe taking your firearms to uh, another firearms owner's house who's going to be home for Christmas, who has the same category of license as you do. If they're going to be home, they might be in a better, better way to protect them and look after them. Um, also, another option is if um, one of your local gun clubs, if you're a member of one of those, they might be able to store them for you over that period. And also, any any licensed firearms dealers do sometimes take in those guns to, to secure them over that period. It's obviously, some people go away for some, some time over Christmas, up to six weeks or more. So, um, that, that would be the, the main points that I'd probably get across of ways to go that little extra step, because at the end of the day, those the security of your firearms is up to you and it's your responsibility. So. That's what I'd be looking at doing. Great. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, um, Lee. That's um, yeah, really, I think, timely information about getting yourself sorted out and producers getting the the right steps in place in terms of firearm and safety over Christmas period. So, um, Brian, I've I've got a uh, probably your, one of your last questions. I'd say with with the time ticking along, I think we'll just take one one from you, and I'll um, I've got another one here for myself as well. So, um, so. Sally's asked, where do I get a permit from if they're looking to get a permit now to do some hazard reduction burns, et cetera? Where should they link in, be going first to link into that? So the best option is just to ring the office here uh, again on that 6881-3900. Uh, we can then get you in contact with the, lo the closest and local permit officer that will be closest to you. Yeah, they're normally a volunteer um, of a, the local brigade uh, and they normally stay a permit officer for quite some time. So once you get that contact person, you can bring them um, for other permits in the future as well. Right. And because we are going across the, the whole of the Central West region, is it advisable that if any of we've got some smaller landholders from, say, around Coonabarabran or or up in that region, where would they, would they be winging the Dubbo sort of district local office there or should they be winging another sort of contact, Brian? They would ring the Castle Ray zone area um, and you could probably find which area you're in through the, the public website. However, um, our staff here would be happy to get you in contact with the right fire control centre. We can transfer that across easily. Yeah, okay. yeah great. Okay, all right, not a worry. Thank you very much for that information, Bron. Um, so I've got the last question I think we'll, we'll take, just knowing that time's ticking along, um, is, is one that's come from, um, from another Chris. We've got, where can I get a biosecurity sign for my property? So um, to answer that um, inquiry there, Chris, is that you can go to any of your, or your closest local land services office. Um, most offices still have uh, signs available to, uh, for landholders and producers, and so they're um, available just to to come in and pick up um, for for those producers as well. Uh, and I'd strongly encourage people to do that. You can also, um, you know, there are some commercial um, rural stores in different locations and towns that also do stock them and sell them. Um, so just knowing what type of biosecurity sign you need in accordance with what type of um, legislation you're trying to ensure that you're, you're um, you know, whether it's for a biosecurity plan, which is under the Biosecurity Act 2015, or whether there's um, there's another type of sign that you're looking for um, in terms of making sure that you're, you're covering different risks or different notifications for your farm as well. So sometimes your rural stores, but look, in terms of the um, Biosecurity Act, um, you know, um, biosecurity signs, um, you can come into your local land services office and, um, and any of the staff within the Central West are happy to help you out with that inquiry as well. Um, so we might pull up question and answer time um, from from about now, I think. We've, we've done done really well and we've had some great engagement, I think, from, uh, from the panel and two um, great questions coming in from all our participants today. Um, so with that, I'll just um, just thank Bron and Lee and I'll um, I'll give them five minutes to take a breath and um, and put them back on mute there. So I'd just like to take the time now um, if you'd like to get in contact with um, with Bron or Lee or myself our contact details are now currently on your screen so certainly um, if there's any further follow-up that you'd like from today's or this evening's webinar, please um, please feel free to do that and reach out. 
Um, certainly, that brings us to the end of this evening's webinar. So I'd really like to thank our presenters, Bronwyn, and also Senior Constable Lee Wormsley. I'd like to thank Wet Robinson, who's been doing some fantastic work behind the scenes uh, and helping um, helping with some technical issues this evening. So that's our first webinar completed for the small acreage webinar series, but certainly um, feel free. There is another, the second webinar will be on the 28th of January, and that's going to be looking at all you need to know for autumn. So invasive pest species control, animal health and life, more livestock biosecurity inquiries with the district veterinarians, weed identification and management with some local council weed officers. And so some great discussion opportunities as well. And, uh, and we look forward to having those discussions with you in about a month's time uh, into the new year and, and certainly um, and getting, getting started on the right foot with those, um, with those types of discussions. So again, I'd sincerely like to thank our panelists this evening. And I'd also like to thank all participants for their time and hope that you've, uh, you've found this event engaging and certainly worthwhile. I look forward to hosting you in future local land services webinars, but for tonight, thank you and good night.